to The Connection, the Heart of Early Childhood podcast. Hi, my name is Katrina Gallegos, and I'm here with my co-host, Ginger Toll. We both live in New Mexico, and also, we really both love coaching. Hi, everybody. Yes, we are both from New Mexico, and we are both excited to talk to September Garrity, CEO of Garrity Education Team. In this episode, The Power of Coaching, you will learn about practice-based coaching and why it's important to invest in your practice. We invite you to pull up a chair as we get to know more about the power of coaching. Welcome, September Garrity. We're so honored to have you on our podcast today. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. So September, tell us a little bit about yourself. I think that maybe the defining thing to say is that I'm really a teacher at heart. When I was a kid, I always played school with my siblings and I always had to be the teacher. And I told them it was because I was the oldest, but really it was just because I always wanted to be the teacher. Um, And so I, I think my background is really that of a teacher and the way I approach coaching has to do with the way I received coaching when I was a teacher And really my goal in everything I do professionally is to make life better for kids. And so that's kind of the driving force behind the work that I do. And um, today I do that by supporting coaches and and supporting teachers, but um, that's always been what's important to me. And then I'm a mom and a stepmom and a wife, you know, all of those other kind of more personal roles, but that's, that's what I would say about myself. That is pretty awesome. September, how many kids do you have? So I have two and my husband has two. They're all adults now, but we raised the four of them together. Our youngest kids were five when we got married. So um, yeah, so we have a a big happy household right now. We just have one at home. My stepdaughter's here for the summer from college, but everybody else is off in their own life. How I mean, nice. she's in her, she's in her own life too, <laughs> but she just happens <laughs> to be living here right now. <laughs> right, that is so neat. Oh, so September, what is practice based coaching? Practice based coaching is a model that brings together all of the research about what it takes to change behavior. And so, when practice based coaching was developed, the folks who developed it were working under a federally funded grant, and they looked at basically all the research on professional development and distilled it down to some elements that we find to be effective over and over again, kind of across contexts, and put those elements together into one very simple, very clean, very clear model. And so I would say practice-based coaching is everything you need to change the behavior of adults. Wow, that is just so amazing. So Ginger, and Ginger's here with us too. Um, She's just been listening to September already, but we've been doing practice-based coaching, um, gosh, already for four years. We're going into our fifth year now in New Mexico. And I wanna bring this up because four and a half years ago, I actually met September um, and it was, the uh, uh, actual training that was going on in the summertime. And so I, I signed up for it because I was teaching at that time. And I heard this thing, practice-based coaching. And I was like, kind of like thrown off a little bit. I'm like, I don't know what this means. I got to go to this training to find out a little bit more. And so in that time, September, I remember actually getting to meet you then in person. And um, I was very intrigued by this model. And so I just like, couldn't wait to find out more about the model. And I just remember still that day getting to meet you and being like, wow, like this can be the change for New Mexico. And so I just had to bring that up. And Ginger, I know that you were there too. I know. I remember that day too. And and I remember um, September standing up front talking to you guys about practice-based coaching. And I had just gone through practice-based coaching training to be a coach and everybody was just so enthralled with everything that, that you said, September. And to think of where we are now compared to where we were four years ago, it, it's, it's an awesome time for the state of New Mexico. You all have 
put in a lot of thought and a lot of work into implementing practice-based coaching really well in New Mexico. I mean, I've, it's been fun to watch that trajectory over the last four years. And I'm thinking about like Katrina in, in the back of the room, like nodding her head and writing everything down and, and Ginger, you were asking some really kind of probing questions and really wanting to make sure that what we were doing was really going to be worth the time and, and effort it was going to take to do it. So I also remember that I, I feel like I have lots of memories of the Wells Fargo building in Albuquerque. <laughs> yes. Uh, that is so true. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's so great to have you here and to finally get to talk to you and talk about where we are in New Mexico with practice-based coaching and, Talk about some, you know, you brought up the research and that that is so interesting to think about where this all started, how it started and how it is changing um, behavior. And and it's for it is for the kids, which is is what we all are here for. So. Yes, that is so true. So September, we are calling this episode the power of coaching. What does that mean to you? So what we know is that change is hard. Like it's, it's hard to make any kind of sustained change of something as complex as teaching, right? Like teaching is really hard. And there are a lot of things that go into good teaching and a lot of um, sort of elements of teaching. And so we layer the complexity of change on top of the complexity of teaching and it becomes exponentially more difficult, right? Like teaching is really complex, change is really hard and coaching is really the best way that we know to actually make change happen. And so when I think about the power of coaching, I just think like coaching is the thing that lets us make a difference in terms of what happens in classrooms and what happens for children every day. So Ginger, going back to what you said about like, it is for the kids, right? And so the power of coaching is that we can use coaching to transform classrooms, which then does make life better for kids. And, and so it's like those adults who are in the classrooms are so influential and also their habits are so entrenched. And we've all had that experience of, you know, going to a training ourselves and getting really excited about the content. And then we go back to our work. And like, even if we were so excited and thought like, oh my gosh, this is so great. I really want to do this. Doesn't mean it actually translates into practice. And one day flows into another, flows into another. And then all of a sudden we realize like, oh yeah, I never really did implement that. And it's not because we didn't want to, it's not that because we were like, quote unquote, resistant or didn't have good intentions or didn't want to do it. It's just, there's an inertia to our daily lives that makes us kind of fall into the same patterns over and over again. And coaching is the thing that can get us to implement what we learn about in training. Yeah. And that is so just amazing what you're saying, because it's true. I mean, really to change your behavior. It, it is hard. It takes time. It takes work. It takes effort and investment too. Like you got to be invested in changing that practice. Um, and it's so amazing that we're here and that we're talking about this because it, it's not easy, I think. And sometimes you just want the easy sprinkled right away, right? Like you said, like go to a training. Great. You have great intentions. You want to do it. And guess what? You come in, your EA is gone and there's multiple things happening. But, you know, having someone along your side in that collaborative partnership, supporting you through supporting you with your practice. I mean, that's, that's amazing. I think it can be really helpful for us to think about our own personal selves. You know, when, when you asked me to, to talk a little bit about myself, one of the things that I could say is that I am learning stuff all the time and I am kind of working out on the edge of my practice in lots of different areas. You both know that I take pottery classes and I do yoga and I do these long bike rides. And all of those are sort of opportunities for me to learn and to think about what it means to learn. And so I can go, oh, here's what my teacher did in pottery that applies to our early childhood classrooms in this way. Or like, 
oh, I'm trying to get myself out of this habit and realizing how hard it is to do. And so maybe our listeners could think about like, what's a, what's a habit that you have that you wish you didn't have, or what's something that you want to do in your own personal life that you maybe don't have the skill to do yet, or it doesn't feel natural to you yet. And think about just how hard it is to do that. And yet somehow when it comes to teachers, we're like, oh, well, they should just be doing all of it all the time. And, you know, I think acknowledging that professional growth is kind of lumpy, that like maybe we're really growing in one area, which means we kind of have to be not growing in another area or more stagnating in another area. And that's a really hard thing for us as people who support professional learning to acknowledge that like not everybody's going to be perfect at all the things all the time. And we can't be growing in every area all the time. And so we really have to be kind of picking and choosing in a realistic way about where, where we're going to focus because change is so hard. But I think somehow we just think like, oh, it should just be magical and easy for teachers. And we get kind of mad at them when they don't change at the pace that we want or in the ways that we want. And I, I think coaching is a way for us to acknowledge the reality that change is hard and then to support that change in actually happening. Yeah, that, I mean, that's pretty amazing too, just what you said, because you're right. I mean, you have to really shift your mindset almost too. And to know that maybe this area you're, you're really going to focus in. And so the other one, like, I like how you said, like might be a little more lumpier over here, <laughs> maybe not as smooth yet, but you're really focusing in this other area and it, and it takes time, you know, and you have to be kind to yourself through this process too. So make sure listeners that you're being kind and just realize it doesn't happen overnight. And that's okay because it does take time. And one of the things that we did we do every year in New Mexico, um, we do a survey. And so at the end of 2022, um, back in May, we did a survey with teachers and we asked, did practice-based coaching improve your teaching practice this year? And we got some really good information. Um, we had 476 respondents and almost 90% of the teachers say yes. So what does that say to you? Well, it says to me that y'all are doing a better job of scaling practice-based coaching than just about anybody anywhere. Um, the fact that you have almost 500 teachers who are being coached and that their experience of coaching is one that they see impacting their practice is really amazing and also not super common. You know, we we know that coaching works and we also know that it's really hard to do coaching well, and it's even harder to do coaching well at scale. So I would say that my takeaway from that statistic, Ginger, that you just shared is that you all are scaling really well and, and that your commitment to the fidelity of the model is really paying off. Yeah. And well, and you know us, September, you know us very well. And, you know, we, we love to see that 90%. However, that means that 10% of our teachers indicate that it's not making any difference. So any suggestions from you on how we can impact that and how we can help them with their practice and child outcomes? Hmm. Such a good question. Because this is really the way that we want teachers to think about children too, right? We don't want teachers to be like, oh, well, 90% of my kids are right. right where they should be. So I don't need to worry about those other 10%. Right. And we need to do the, the, there's a parallel process for sure with coaching and, and with teaching. And so we want to be thinking just as hard about that 10% as we are about the 90%. And as I think about this, there are a few different sort of avenues of conversation that we could go down first, I would be really curious about the goals and priorities of those teachers and how they do or don't see coaching as connected to what they really want for themselves, for their children, for their classrooms. Sometimes coaching doesn't feel connected to what's important to a teacher. And so that might be a reason that they're saying, mm -hmm. mm, maybe it's not a good use of my time, or maybe I'm not seeing it as valuable. And um, Jen Schwanke, I think has a new book coming out and I don't know the name of it, but I heard her being interviewed about the way that she's thinking about um, 
supporting adults. And she talked about kind of a tree where the roots are the priorities of the person. And so one of the questions might be like, why are you a teacher? What got you into this profession in the first place? What is it that you want to accomplish in the work that you do with children every day and really kind of uncovering what that teacher's priorities are so that then we can connect um, coaching to that and, and thinking about maybe the teacher's purpose is to support children but they also um, just came back from maternity leave and they had twins. So they have a greater purpose that this is what they want to do, but then their priorities as you move up the trunk of the tree turn out to be that their priority is like getting through the day because <laughs> they're not sleeping at night. And, and so understanding that could have something to do with it. And it's only when we know what the purpose is and what the priorities are of that individual that we can start to think about their patterns and their habits in the classroom. And so really getting curious about individual teachers, knowing that there's not an average teacher. And so coaches can really work on kind of creating that connection and understanding what teachers want instead of coming in and just being like, well, here's what we're working on, or here's what we're supposed to be working on, or here's what I see, or here's what you need. And really finding out what those teachers think they need. So that's one thing is that like curiosity about the teacher's experience, the teacher's purpose in teaching the teacher's priorities. Um, I also wonder if some of those classrooms are seeing change and the teachers just haven't connected that change to coaching. And so I think coaches can do a, a really intentional, um, I would say coaches can intentionally connect what's happening in coaching to changes that are happening in the classroom and really making that impact explicit might change the way that teachers are responding to that survey, because it mm -hmm. might be that there's an impact and they just haven't seen it or they haven't connected it with coaching. And so as a coach, I'm always kind of pulling out from my coaches. Here's what I see changing in your practice. Remember when we worked on this goal and now I'm seeing you do this really naturally, or remember how it, this was at the beginning of the year and now how it is here. And can we trace that back to what that's happened in coaching. And, and so I think coaches can explicitly connect coaching with change in practice. And then the third thing that I would think about in terms of those 10% is do the coaches have the skills to support those particular teachers? And, you know, again, there's this connection with the parallel process sometimes a teacher is just not the right teacher for a kid, or sometimes a teacher really has to grow in their practice in order to be able to support a child. And so, you know, sometimes teachers are fine, 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 fine. And then all of a sudden they get a group of kids that they're like, whoa, I don't know. I mean, I had that experience as a teacher, right. you know, um, like I thought I was a really good teacher. And now all of a sudden I've got these three children in my class and I don't know what to do. And I need to figure out how to better support them. And I think the same thing can happen with coaches. Sometimes coaches need to work on their coaching skills. Sometimes mm -hmm. they need to get a better understanding of the teaching practices so that they can really support teachers and thinking deeply about those practices. And so that's another possible avenue to explore with that 10% is like, how do we grow the skills of those coaches who are working with teachers who may be more um, challenging to coach for one reason or another? And, and when I say challenging, I'm not meaning that they're resistant or <laughs> that they are um, like the bad teachers or impossible. I'm just saying that there are some teachers who are going to stretch a coach's skills, just like there are some children who are going to stretch a teacher's skills. Those are all such valid points. And you know, just thinking about it in those different avenues is so helpful. So listeners out there, be thinking about that. And if you're a coach, realize that keep doing what you're doing and practice-based coaching can be done to fidelity. And that's so important to stick to that. And we can get to those teachers if we, if we just keep trying and striving. So great suggestions. I appreciate that so much. So September, what research or thoughts do you have about who coaching works for? So quite honestly, the research about that is all over the place. And kind of the, the conclusion that I draw is that the way we implement coaching matters and the effectiveness of the coach matters in terms of who can benefit from coaching. And when coaches are skilled, 
and when we're implementing a coaching model with fidelity, then I think coaching can benefit everyone. So when it's done well, everyone can benefit from coaching. The other piece of that is that there also has to be time for coaching. So mm -hmm. if we say we're coaching and we don't actually commit to figuring out how to provide the time, which I acknowledge is really challenging in many instances, then um, probably nobody's going to benefit from coaching if, if we're kind of doing coaching in name only, but not really coaching. And I also think that there may be some occasions where someone's priorities are in a different place, right? If someone's getting a master's degree, it may be more challenging for them to benefit from coaching because they're working on stuff in lots of different avenues. And there again, I would say it's like the skill of the coach to connect what the teacher's priorities are and what the teacher's already learning to what we're doing in coaching. So coaching isn't seen as just one more thing or something extra, but is seen as a way to integrate and implement all of the things that that person is learning. Same thing would be true for, I, I don't know why I made up this example, but like the teacher who's having twins, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, coaching could feel to that teacher, like something that they just have to check the box on or just like get through, or it could feel like, oh, coaching is the thing that's making everything else easier. Um, and so I'm just going to go back again to the skill of the coach. I think a skilled coach can benefit anyone, regardless of where they are. What I really want to dispel is the notion that only bad teachers can benefit from coaching or only our folks who are really struggling in one area or another are the people that we should be coaching. And I always use the sports analogy. You know, we, we wouldn't take the coaches away from the team that won the Super Bowl because they just won. Um, you know, everybody, whether they're at the top of their game or they're really struggling can benefit from coaching. So Timber, this kind of leads me into um, my next thought and question over here is what would you tell a teacher that seems to be like a little bit nervous about recording a focus observation as they focus on a specific practice? So I don't know that there's something that we can tell them that's going to make them less nervous. I think that some nervousness might just be a real thing for teachers and I also think that it doesn't matter what we tell them if we don't back that up with who we are and how we approach things. So if we say, oh, don't worry, it's non-evaluative and we're just watching to improve your practice and we're just focused on this one specific thing that you're doing. But then when we have our reflection and feedback conversation and we bring up eight other things that they did, then it doesn't matter what we said in the, in the beginning, because now we've kind of broken that trust with them and made it feel different than we said it would feel. Or if we say this is non-evaluative, but then we start our reflection and feedback meeting with a whole bunch of feedback that feels evaluative, even if it's separated totally from supervision, where if we start our reflection and feedback meeting, really being curious about what the teacher said or did and what they thought as they were doing it and what they thought as they were watching their own video, then it's a completely different kind of conversation. So I don't think there's something we can say that will make teachers feel better about it. I just think that, you know, what I say to teachers is let's just try it. Like this is just an experiment. If you decide that you want to film yourself eight times before you share one with me, I'm fine with that. I know that some people kind of push back on that. Most teachers don't have time to film themselves <laughs> eight times anyway, but, but I don't really care if a teacher sends me something that has been practiced over and over again, because really that's what we want is for them to be practicing this skill over and over again. And so that's an opportunity for them to do it. And so I say, you know, just try it out, just do it once and send it to me, no matter what it looks like. Or if you want to do it eight times and then send it to me, that's fine. Because the purpose of this is for you to think about your own practice and for you to get better. And sometimes we can't get better until we see ourselves in action. And that's so true. Um, I think about this piece too. Like, you know, I thought about Tom Brady when you first were talking, that's who came into my mind, you know, because the Super Bowl. And I was thinking about it, even if he wins, like you said, he's going back probably and watching his film multiple times. I even think about when I was engaging in the PD project and then even in peer-to-peer, -peer, I'm recording myself as a coach because 
I, it, it helps me, but then if I'm really focusing in on a certain practice, I, I need to go back and watch it for myself. And man, does it make a difference? There's times that I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I did that. Like, what the heck? And then there's other times where I'm like, wow, like I could totally see my practice shifting and changing at this moment. And man, you know, a couple of cycles ago, it, it wasn't there at that level. Now it is because I had a collaborative partnership with my coach, my master coach, and she was helping me grow. And so, and just being there and supporting me through that process. And so the, just the power of coaching is what I keep thinking in my head too. <laughs> the power of coaching. <laughs> I know. And I remember way back four years ago when I first started coaching, that was one of the first tasks that you gave us was to record our self coaching. And I think back on that video that I took of myself coaching and how I've grown as a coach since then. And it is, it's so important to record yourself, watch yourself because you, like you said, Katrina, you didn't, you didn't realize you do things. It's like have a reaction to what someone says and it's, you know, those things matter and words matter. And so, you know, just really trying to refine our ability to coach so that it's benefit, beneficial to the teachers. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, coaching, it, it's such a fun thing to do, but it's not easy either. So, you know, and, and September, you talked about the reflection and feedback. And we know that there are multiple components to practice-based coaching. So, is there one component that's more important than the other or what are, what are your thoughts about that? Well, like I said in the beginning, the practice-based coaching model was built by looking at what the research says about what it takes to change practice. And there has been some work done since the model was developed around professional learning, professional development, different approaches to professional learning. And um, one of the more recent um, studies that I actually, it may be pre-publication still, um, there, was, there was someone who looked at kind of what they called the active ingredients for professional learning, because sometimes it's like toothpaste, right? Like the minty flavor <laughs> isn't what actually cleans your teeth. And the same thing can be true with professional learning. Like the part that makes it fun or engaging isn't necessarily the part that changes practice. And so when we can identify the active ingredients in some form of professional learning, then we can have a sense of what's actually making a difference for teacher practice. And so what this more recent meta-analysis looked at was the number of active ingredients in any kind of professional learning opportunity. And what they found is that if we just have one or two ingredients, it's probably not going to make a difference in practice. And the more active ingredients you layer on top of each other, the more likely it is that teachers will actually change their practice. And so when we think about the practice-based coaching model, there's not a piece that I would go, oh, well, you could kind of take this out and it would still be okay, right? I mean, if we take away the collaborative partnership, then it just feels like something that we're forcing upon people. And when was the last time that anybody forced anything on you that you really were like, oh yes, please. I want more <laughs> of that. <laughs> nice. um, and and the understanding and the the connection between humans. I mean, teaching is a human endeavor and so is coaching. Um, and so we can't get rid of the collaborative partnership. We also can't get rid of the focus on effective practices because if we do that, then it's just like the coach trying to be somebody's new best friend and teachers don't need a new best friend. And I always say to coaches, if they did, they probably wouldn't pick you. So <laughs> like <laughs> we need to you know, the, another way we talk about this is coaching light versus coaching heavy. Teachers are so busy. They do not have time to waste on something that is like sort of frou-frou or fluffy or useless. What we need is something that's actually going to make a difference in classrooms. And that's the focus on effective practice. So we can't get rid of that. And then when we think about what we actually do, we get into the coaching cycle. So we have, you know, setting a goal. Well, if we don't have a goal, then we don't have any way to know where we're going and we don't have any way to know if we're there. And so we have to set some kind of goal. 
And then the focused observation is an opportunity for us to have a common point of conversation in our reflection and feedback. And so if the coach hasn't done a focused observation, we don't actually know what happened in the classroom. And if the teacher hasn't really thought about a particular moment in time, they don't have anything really concrete to reflect on. And, and so the focused observation gives us that sort of third point that we can then discuss and talk about and, and a point to move on from as we think about our next action planning. And then the reflection and feedback piece, we know that teachers really need time to reflect. And if they don't have that, their practice will not improve. And so we can have that opportunity to give them some structured reflection time in the practice-based coaching cycle. And we also know that some level of feedback is required for teachers to change their practice. And so reflection and feedback is there too. The other piece that isn't explicitly called out in the model, but is called out in the research is modeling. And teachers have to know what something looks like in order to be able to do it well. And so there are opportunities both during the, the time that coaches spend with teachers in their meeting, or if they're spending time with teachers in the classroom, there are some opportunities to provide that modeling. And um, you both know I'm a big proponent of video modeling, which is like showing teachers several different video examples of different teachers using a practice so that they can start to think about how it might look in their own classroom. And so when we think about those active ingredients, when we put all of it together, it's super powerful. If we take any of those active ingredients out, it's going to be less effective and less powerful. And that's, that's so exciting to hear you talk about the modeling, because that is something that we have really geared up this year to start providing. And so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so what advice would you give to coaches and teachers as we begin the new year with practice-based coaching? I'm going to think back to those, those roots of the tree and think about purpose. Why are we doing this? Um, what are we hoping to accomplish? And really thinking about kind of calibrating what the coach is thinking about, what the teacher is thinking about, and what the administrators are thinking about too, and figuring out like, why are we spending all this time and all this money on coaching? What is it we want to accomplish? And having a common understanding of what that is you know, across a, a coaching partnership, across a building, across a school district, across the state could be really helpful. But, but when I think about those individual coaches and teachers, I'm thinking we want to sit down together and say, what is it that we want to have happen this year? What would your hope be for the end of the year? And how can I support you in getting to where you want to get by the end of the year? And the, the other question I always ask about anything we do is like, who is it for? And if we're doing this again, because we're supposed to, or because we need to check some box or because somebody said that coaching is a good thing to do, or it's mandated, it's not going to get us very far. But if we really think about, oh, this is for the teachers and the children, this is a gift that we're providing, then everything we do can approach coaching in that way. Not like, mm -hmm. a, oh, well, you need to be thankful for this gift that I'm <laughs> giving you. <laughs> but, but more in the sense of like, I'm doing this for you. I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it to serve the children that you're serving. And, and I'm doing it to be here with and for you. And so let's think about what we want to accomplish together. And so those two questions, like, why are we doing this? And who is it for kind of drive all of the work that I do. And I would hope it would drive the work of coaching in New Mexico this year. That's great advice. And thank you for, thank you for your perspective. Just love talking to you. And huh, now we're ready for coaching in New Mexico. So yes, we are Ginger. We are definitely <laughs> ready, ready to go out there and meet with our teachers. And we're very excited about it for sure. Um, September. So I know that you love practice-based coaching, but I want to know a little bit more about why you felt it was important to start the PD project. Maybe tell our listeners a little bit about it and just tell us a little bit more. Yeah. So the Coach PD project is what I call comprehensive professional development for coaches. The reason I started it is because that I know 
that most professional learning in education doesn't have any impact on practice that we, you know, send teachers to trainings, they go back to their classrooms, nothing changes. We've spent a lot of time and a lot of money to accomplish nothing in terms of what happens every day for children. And I know that instructional coaching can really work. And I also know that in a lot of places it's done really badly or we say we're doing coaching, but we're not actually doing coaching. And so I think that instructional coaching is the most important thing for improving teaching and for improving child outcomes. But many or even most instructional pro coaching programs just don't live up to that promise of the power of coaching. Um, and so I started the Coach PD project to provide everything that coaches need to be effective, no matter what context they're working in, no matter what they're coaching on, no matter who they're coaching, and no matter what their experience level is as coaches. And so my goal with the Coach PD project is to help every coach be able to transform classrooms. So the other piece of this is that we provide lots of PD for teachers and coaches get very little professional development. Um, usually a coach gets hired and they're just kind of thrown out on their own, like, good luck, have fun. We sent you to a training. Now you implement, even though the research says that sending people to training is not going to lead to implementation in practice. And so I know there are a lot of struggling coaches out there. There are a lot of coaches who are spending a lot of time, like searching the internet for something, anything to help them know how to do their job. I know there are a lot of coaches who never actually coach because they don't know what coaching is. Their administrators don't know what coaching is. And I know there are a lot of coaches who don't know what it feels like to be coached. And so I created the Coach PD project to kind of solve all of those problems and to guarantee that coaches really are able to transform classrooms through coaching. And September, I actually was one of the people actually in the PD project. And I definitely will say that it really impacted me as a coach. And so I think that, you know, if you guys have opportunity out there, coaches, wherever you guys are at, I know here in New Mexico, we actually do have coaches that go through um, the PD project. And so I'm happy to know that in New Mexico, um, you know, we're investing in this because it is making a difference with us as coaches. Um, and so I think it's awesome. So September, if they want to contact you, what, what's your contact information? They can find me at practicebasedcoaching.com. It's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, now we're going to get to an even more fun event here that we're going to do with you September. This is what I love to do at the very end. Um, and Ginger loves this piece too, but who is the real September Garrity? So do you really want to know? <laughs> yes, we do. We definitely want to know who has the best chili, New Mexico or Colorado? Oh, you wanted to get me in trouble with this question, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> for the record, I live in Colorado, but I am going to vote New Mexico chili all the way. I'm so sorry to my uh, friends in Pueblo. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, September, I appreciate that. But we have to know every time you come here, though, September, what is the one dish that you always get? Chili rellenos every time. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> Chili rellenos with green. Chili rellenos with green. Yeah, we always hear you say that. So, and you know what? I'm a chili relleno girl myself. So we'll have to go to dinner next time you're in New Mexico. Yes, and please. What keeps bringing you back to the land of enchantment? So I am a New Mexico native and my heart is really a little bit in New Mexico. The first thing that I think of is chili rellenos for sure. <laughs> like chili rellenos anywhere else are not the same mm -hmm. as New Mexico chili rellenos. And then I feel a little bit guilty because the second thing is my family. <laughs> I have lots of aunts and uncles and cousins who, who live in New Mexico still, but I... I think chili rellenos is still first on that list. Um, and, and it does feel like home. You know, when I come back, I have spent so many years of my life there and spent so much time there that it just feels like a place that I belong to and that it belongs to me. And I will also say it's the instructional coaches that bring me back for sure. Oh, thank so. you, September. 
<laughs> we love you too. <laughs> so we know that you love to read. Are you currently reading anything right now? Is that a question? <laughs> <Let me. laughs> all the things all the time. I, um, I pulled out my stack of books here and these are the things that I'm currently reading. I have the learning professional journal, the what, why, and how of the revised standards for professional learning, um, differentiated mentoring and coaching and education, which is a book that was written by a former coach of mine. She coached me when I was a teacher and we've remained colleagues. I have this library book called Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. And I have to say, when I got this, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so thick. And then I was like, that's <laughs> the whole point of this book is that you need to not be intimidated. Um, in the Coach PD project this summer, we're doing a book study on soundtracks. So that has been my kind of ever-present companion this summer. Yesterday at a little free library in my neighborhood, I picked up this fiction book called When She Dreams, and I just started that last night. So those are the physical books that I'm reading. And then if I open up my Kindle, um, the books that I've read in the last week, um, Lead Like a Pirate, um, Deep Work, The One Thing, Growing Gills, those are all kind of nonfiction books that I was referring to as I was working on um, I'm doing some coaching of a, a director of a childcare program and, and her um, next set of practices is all around time management. And so I was really just making sure that we had a robust system for um, her to do a needs assessment around time management. Um, and then I've got some library books on my Kindle too. The Golden Couple, uh, The Glass Hotel is one I haven't started yet, but it's it's mm -hmm. going to happen this week because it's about to go back to the library. Mm -hmm. And then every night before I go to sleep, I read some trashy books, some some <laughs> romance novels that <laughs> just kind of put me to sleep. So uh, you, you should have known when you asked that question <laughs> that it wasn't going to be like one book. <laughs> no, but I do want to know, when do you sleep? <laughs> I I get so much sleep. I, I'm a really fast reader. And I also really view this as kind of my role in our field is I take in all of this stuff, right? Like I, I listen to probably 15 podcasts a day and I'm reading all of these books at once. And what I do is I kind of sift through it and I find those first principles and I really curate the resources that I think will be useful to people. And that's the stuff that goes into the Coach PD project, right? So I think my role is like, I take everything in and then I help everybody else know, like, here are the things that are going to be really useful. Here are the things that are going to be really helpful. You all can just focus on those core principles and those few things that I've just like handed to you because I've looked at all of the other stuff. So it's another gift, guys. Another gift right there. That is <laughs> Whether you amazing. want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if your family could describe you in one word, just one, one word. Yeah, just one. Yes. <laughs> what would they come up with for you? So I actually asked my husband and my stepdaughter this this morning, and I didn't give them very much time. Um, and they struggled a little <laughs> bit. And then I was like, I think the the words that they came up with are probably ones that um, you will understand. So my husband, the first thing he said was focused. Mm -hmm. And then um, my stepdaughter said, um, that she didn't put it in one word. She said, well, you're in control of your life, but you're not controlling. And then they kind of talked <laughs> together and they came up with intentional. So um, <laughs> it's not like the most um, warm, fuzzy word, but that's probably accurate <laughs> in terms of describing me. Oh, um, well, I love it. <laughs> I was just going to say, September, there is not one word that could describe you 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 are a multiple faceted talented lady and we so appreciate everything that you've done for us and taught us and we just we look forward to the continuation of having this great partnership with you and uh, moving forward with practice-based coaching thank you so much ginger and really there's not one word that could describe anyone right like we're all complex and multifaceted beings but yeah, I, I love the partnership that we've had and I, I do look forward to it continuing and to continuing to watch all of you grow as coaching grows in New Mexico. It's It's been so fun to see it so far and I know that'll continue. 
Well, thank you so much for all your support and spending some time with us um, this morning. We look forward to continuing our partnership with you. Thank you so much, Katrina. Hey, Katrina, wasn't that a remarkable interview that we had with September Garrity about practice-based coaching? Yes, it was definitely noteworthy. It was noteworthy. Oh my goodness. She talked about the importance of coaching for coaches. She talked about the importance of coaching for teachers and it can even help administrators. So, you know, it's just so insightful the way that she looks at practice-based coaching. And I am so blessed to have had her as my trainer for practice-based coaching. How about you? Same here. And I just love how she was able to just see it in different lenses too. And that, that just helps us all to understand practice-based coaching. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about the components of practice-based coaching, you know, setting a goal, collection and feedback, and the focus observation, how important those are. And then she mentioned the video modeling. And, you know, that's exactly where we're heading in New Mexico with video modeling. So Look out, New Mexico teachers. Here come your coaches with some more supports for practice-based coaching. And teachers, I think, are going to really appreciate that, too, to see that practice in action. Yeah, and, you know, we're just we're doing this for the kids, and that's so important that we remember that focus, that it's all about the kids. It is all about the children here in New Mexico. One last thing that I definitely want to add in is, oh, my gosh, Ginger, we have to give September a shout out for all the books that she's been reading. That is such a long list. So listeners, do not worry. We are going to put that where you guys are able to get that list as well, because there is a lot of great books that she is reading. And now I've got to add to my reading list. So glad that we were able to spend time with you and we look forward to next time.